Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We began sharing with you on the subject of being a doer of the word, and we talked about becoming a continual doer of the word of God. Tonight we're going to continue on that, and we're going to talk about what believers are to do if they're going to be doers of the word according to what the Bible declares. We begin in James chapter 1, verse 22, where it says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We pointed out this morning that when we put the cursor over the be ye, you find out that it is a word in the Greek, and for you who are here for the first time, you will see that in the lower window, there is the Strong's number corresponding to Strong's concordance, the Greek word, and then there'll be a meaning and other information that is important to look at. Notice that this particular word, ginomai, means to become. It doesn't mean be, it means to become. And this particular word, as we pointed out, happens to be an imperative mood statement. The imperative mood is a command. God has commanded us to become doers of the word. And we see also that this is a present tense verb. The present tense verb means continuous ongoing action. So what this is saying is that we are, to, we are commanded to become continually doers of the word and not hearers only. If we are hearers only, it says we're deceiving our own selves. And it's interesting, it doesn't mean we just deceived ourselves for a moment. It actually is a present tense verb. Present tense in the Greek means continuous ongoing action. So what it's saying is that we're continually deceiving our own selves. That means the devil doesn't even have to work against us. If we won't do the word, we'll be deceived because it's the word in us that is going to bring forth the promises of God and bring all the things that God wants to bring forth in our life. He goes on and says, If any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's likened to a man beholding his natural face, face in a glass. He says, he beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. So it's just like the guy, he saw himself, now he goes away, and he can't remember who he is any longer. If you don't do the word, you will not retain the word. It will not become a part of your lifestyle. You will not walk in the light of it. He goes on and says, but whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he, not be a, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. When it talks about looking, this is a word which means to look carefully into and inspect, looking by studying the word of God, not casually, but looking into it diligently, into the perfect law of liberty, which is what the word of God is, and continue there, and you abide, you remain in it. This is what you do continually. You're not gonna be a forgetful here, but you're a doer of the work, because as you're a doer of the word, you're a doer of the work. What work? The work of working out your own salvation, working the word in your life, working your faith, and you're going to be blessed in your doing, in all the things that we do. This is why God wants us to be a consistent hearer and doer of the word. So we need to become a continual doer of the word. Now, we talked about many principles today and qualities that are necessary in the morning service. We won't be repeating any of that tonight. But we're going to talk about the things that we must do as believers according to the word if we're going to become doers of the word. We do need to eliminate hindrances, first of all. In Galatians chapter 5, what would hinder you from becoming a doer of the word? Galatians chapter 5, verse 17 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you will. The word would or will, what you will to do. You won't be able to do the things you, want, you will to do if you're letting the flesh dominate you. That's why you and I must not let the flesh have control. We must crucify the flesh daily, as the Bible says. We're to put off the deeds of the flesh, mortify the deeds of the body, and we are to walk in the spirit, as it says back in verse 16, and then you will not fulfill the lust or the strong desires of the flesh. 
This is essential. So the things that you want to do, you're not going to be able to do them as long as you let the flesh operate. That's why it's mandatory to crucify the flesh. That will be a hindrance from you being able to become a consistent doer of the word. Because we're going to walk in the spirit. Over in 1 John, in verse 6, we see another hindrance. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We cannot be walking in darkness. Walking in darkness is opposite of walking in the light. What's the light? The word of God. If we walk in the light, we're walking in the word. If we're not walking in the word, then we're walking in darkness, whether we realize it or not. And it says we are not doing the truth. Therefore, we've got to turn away from all of the ways of darkness all of the ways of the world, all the ways of sin, all the ways of unrighteousness. We cannot be walking in those ways whatsoever. We also see over in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 48. Jeremiah 48 verse 10 tells us also something that would be a hindrance. It says, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from the blood. So if we do the work of the Lord deceitfully, or this means slack, slack, being lazy, not in a way that God wants, the way he expects us to do things, we're going to be cursed. This is why God wants to be a diligent doer of the word. We do it with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength. We carry out all the things that he tells us to do. So be sure that you're not just, just doing things however you want to do it. No, you're being diligent to do the things that God says. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Another hindrance is if you get weary in the midst of well-doing. Otherwise, you get wearied out, you get exhausted, as it says, Ed, it says here. You, you know, the Bible says that we will reap in due season if we faint not. We're not to get wearied and faint in our minds, another scripture talks about. You've got to guard yourself from getting weary and well-doing. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Do everything unto the Lord. Know that when you're doing things unto the Lord, you're doing what He wants. You're going to be rewarded. You're going to be blessed. It's going to produce good results. Even though you may not have seen results yet, you continue to do the Word. God will bring those promises to pass in your life. So we don't want to get weary or be one who draws back from doing the things that God wants. Certainly hindrances to you becoming a doer of the word is if you walk in the flesh, or you walk in darkness, or you're lost, lost, or lazy, slack, or you get weary, and you don't be consistent in doing the word. The answer is be diligent and do everything with all of your heart, with all of your might, with all of your strength. Put your all into it. If you're going to do something, you might as well put your all into it and not do things half-hearted. Now, what are the things that God wants us to do? In Exodus chapter 19, we see in verse 7, When Moses came and called for the elders of the people, he laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. God's given us the word. It's laid before us in the word of God. All the words now in the New Testament that we're commanded to carry out. And they said, the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now that's the right response. That's our response. All that God has spoken that he wants us to do, we're going to do it. So we are going to make the decision that we're going to be doers of everything that God is instructing us to do and telling us to do and commanding us to do. All that he's spoken to us, we're going to do, carry out the word of God. Because they, you're going to be becoming a doer because you're doing thing, scripture after scripture, point after point, that he is instructing us to. We see in Exodus chapter 24, in verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, saying, All the words as the Lord has said, we will do. We see it again here. In verse 7, took the book of the covenant, read it in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. I chose you. As you are doing God's word, you're being obedient to him. You're not just doing something just to carry out principles to see some result. You're actually being obedient to the living God, carrying out the things that he wants us to do. So it's important that we realize when we're doing God's word, we're being obedient to God. Obedience is so important. He wants us to be obedient in all things. He's looking for a people who will be obedient. You know, when you obey, blessing is going to come on you. When you disobey, 
curses will come upon us. We must be ones that are going to be obedient. And it must be a willing obedience from the heart. Numbers chapter 23, over in verse 26. Here's where Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told I not thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. Remember, Balak was trying to get Balaam to curse the Israelites, and he couldn't do it because God you know, told him otherwise, of course, that he was not to do that. And so he says, All the Lord speaks, I must do. This isn't the fact that I'm just going to try to do something. I'm, we're going to be obedient to do it. We realize we must do it. It's part of the covenant that we have with God. So God's word is something we're to do, it's something we're to be obedient, it's something that we actually should have the attitude, I must do it. I'm expected to do it, I'm in covenant relationship, and I will do whatever the Lord tells me to do. So you get this kind of mindset in your heart, you'll be a, become a doer of the word, because you won't be even thinking twice about not doing God's word. You'll be ready to put it in operation in your life. Now over in Numbers chapter 30, in verse 2, it says, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swears an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word, but he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. You know, what we say, should, we should be carrying it out. You make a vow to the Lord, you're going to do such and such, or you swear an oath to bind your soul with a bond, which is what you're doing. We shouldn't break our word. Our word should be our bond. We should be carrying out. If you're going to say you're going to do something, do it. Don't say something and then do something else. Be sure that you do according to all the proceeds out of your mouth. That's important. God wants us to do that. In the society today, people say things and don't carry them out all the time. Now, just because we're living in a, a rebellious society that doesn't do things today, don't let yourself fall into that. That's not God's ways. God wants you to be carrying out the things that you say that you're going to do it. If you say you're going to do it, be sure you carry it out. Numbers chapter 32, verse 20. Moses said to him, If you will do this thing, if you will go armed before the Lord to war. God expected them to get armed and go into the war, into the battle. What are we to do in the New Testament? We're to put on the whole armor of God through the Word of God in us, the Word of God in our mind, the Word of God in our heart, the Word of God in our mouth, the Word of God directing our steps, the Word of God that's going to produce the power of God resonant within us. And he says, we're going to go armed before the Lord to war. We're going to enter into warfare. And our warfare, remember, is not against people. It's a spiritual warfare, fighting the good fight of faith, warring a good warfare. He says, if all you go, we'll go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he's driven out his enemies from before him, which was the purpose. They had to destroy all their enemies. That's the purpose for us, to put the armor of God on. We're going to go and destroy our spiritual enemies to see them be eliminated as we go to possess our spiritual promised land, the promises of God. And the land be subdued before the Lord, that afterward you shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. Remember these physical things are important for us because they are physical types and shadows of spiritual realities for us today. The physical land is a type of the spiritual land, which is the promises of God that you and I are to possess. It's been given to us. We are going to engage in spiritual war by putting on the spiritual armor of God, and we're going to go armed against our enemies until they be destroyed and put underfoot. And when it's been subdued, it knows, notice he says, you're going to be guiltless before the Lord. That means that if we don't do it, we are guilty before him. He expects us to do this. God has not given us just an, a nice little option. Well, you can go help do some warfare over here if you feel like it. No, he commanded them to do this. They were expected to engage in the spiritual warfare to destroy the enemies, and then they would be able to possess their promised land. Verse 23, he says, If you will not do so, if you don't go in and conquer these enemies, behold, you've sinned against the Lord. That means spiritual warfare is not just a nice little suggestion or option or just a desire that God would like maybe some people to enter into. No, it's for every believer in Jesus Christ. We're all commanded to fight the good fight of faith and war good warfare and conquer the enemies, cast out the demons, destroy the works of the enemies. He said, you've sinned against the Lord. Be sure your sin will find you out. No, we don't want to give place to the enemy whatsoever. 
The children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke unto Moses, said, Thy servants will do as my Lord commanded. They were ready to respond. Not all the tribes were responding properly, but there were some that did. There's certainly going to be a remnant today of the body of Christ who are going to engage in what God has commanded them to do. And they're going to take their place, having put on the armor of God, and they're going to engage in the spiritual warfare, doing the will of God. That's exactly what you and I are expected to do. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 32. You shall observe to do, therefore, as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. God doesn't want us to turn to the right or the left. That means we would turn some other way. We're not going to try another way. There's only one way to see things get accomplished. It's doing what God has commanded, following the Lord, being obedient unto Him. God's Word is the way. There's a way of righteousness, a way of holiness, a way of victory, a way that God's going to bring forth everything that He says. It's the way of His Word. Do not try, turn to the right or left or try to do it another way. We see Christians all the time trying to do other things. They do things after the flesh. They do things after the ways of the world instead of doing things God's way. And they wonder why they're some not seeing results. We need to follow His way, and then we'll see God perform His Word in our life. Joshua 1.16, They answered and said, All that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. Well, we're to do everything He commands. We're also to go forth where He sends us. What is he se where has He sent us? He sent us into the world to do what? To preach the gospel. You and I are to preach the gospel. He told every one of us to go. He commanded us to preach the gospel to every creature and to minister the, the, the gospel, to be, see people be saved, but also to cast out the demons and heal the sick and do the mighty works of the Lord. You are an ambassador for Christ. You're a representative of Him. You are a child from, remember, born from above means you're a citizen of heaven and you're representing Him. And you are to go forth and represent Him, holding forth the word of life, preaching the gospel with the word of reconciliation, because it's our ministry. Every one of us has a ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, God wants you to obey and go forth and carry out His ministry. You've got a ministry. Don't think, oh, I thought it was just for certain people. No, you've got a ministry, and God expects us to carry it out because we're going to give answer at the end of our days. Hey, did you do what I commanded? Did you go out there and preach the gospel and cast out the demons and minister healing to people and, and do the things that I commanded? We want to be sure we have a good report. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and asterisks from among you. Prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him only, and He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. The Philistines were the enemies, and that's a type of God delivering us out of the hand of our the enemies, which are evil spirits. Notice, before the promise of delivering you out of your enemy's hand, there were some prerequisites. There were some things that they were to do. Number one, they had to return to the Lord with all their hearts. We must give our heart unto the Lord, and we must put His word first place and do what He commands. They said, put away the strange gods and asterisks from among you. That's the idols. We've got to get rid of all idolatry in our life. And one of the biggest idols is self, doing what I want to do, essentially serving self. No, we're, we're not going to live unto self any longer. We're going to live unto the Lord. We're going to put Him first place. And he said, prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him. God wants you to prepare your heart that you are going to serve the Lord. You are not here to build us for no more, kind of our house, our, just all for what we want. No, you're here to serve the Lord, to build the kingdom of God, and to build the things that God wants in your life. Prepare your heart and serve Him only at all times. Over in 2 Kings chapter 22, here Jehoshaphat, it says he was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Mother's name was Jediah, the daughter of Adiah, the Boscath. And he did that was right in the sight of the Lord. Josiah was a good king. He did what was right. He walked in all the way of David his father, and he turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So he did the things that God wanted. It came to pass the 18th year of King Josiah. Here the king sent Japhon, Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Mishulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord. And he was saying, Go up to this Gilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver 
which is brought on the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. And notice what he says. He says, let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house. Now what's this talking about? This is talking about he's given the silver, which is the money. So who does God want to give the money to? Now he's going to meet everybody's needs. We have the promise of that. But who does he want to bring great amount of money into their hands? So that they, doers of the work, <coughs> that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, doers of the work are going to go repair the breaches of the house. What are the breaches? All the places where the enemy has broken through the breaks because of sin. And you're going to go and repair the things that the enemy has done. That means you're going to be out there ministering to people to see restoration, to see people get delivered, to see people get healed, to people get, see, see people get restored. Who's the one that's going to get the money from the Lord? It's the doers. The doers. Because what's the purpose of him bringing the finances into you? We're talking about besides your needs being met, is he wants to give it you, you for the propagation of the gospel so that you can carry out the ministry of the Lord. Because that's what you and I are here to do with the finances that comes to us. Well, he comes down and says here, that there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand because they dealt faithfully. God trusted them. He trusted them with the money. With the money that's been given unto you, can God trust you that you're going to use it for the right things? Of course, it's to use for the ministry of all the things that are coming for you in your household, all your needs to be met. He wants us to have all things richly to enjoy. The Bible talks about he'll give us all sufficiency, but also he gives us amount to abound to every good work which is for us to give out for the gospel. And here he said, these guys were dealing faithfully. Well, that was a good report. We come down to verse 13, though. He says, Go and require of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of the book that's found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that's kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to unto all that was written concerning us. That's something. The fact is, they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they had wrath, great wrath of the Lord. Otherwise, judgment came because they didn't do according to all that was written concerning us. That means God's expecting us to do what he says. He's going to bring finances into your hands for those who are doers of the work that are going to be out there working and in, in doing the repairing of all what the enemies accomplished to bring destruction. If you're faithful, then you are going to, of course, be rewarded for that. He knows the ones that are going to be faithful. If we don't hearken, great wrath will come against them. You see, we've got to realize God's got, an, uh, he's got a plan for every one of us. He's got an agenda for you and me. We've got to find out what he wants to do and carry it out in our life. In 1 Chronicles 17, verse 2, Nathan said unto David, Do all that's in thine heart, for God is with thee. God wants you to do all that's in your heart that he has placed in you. And through his word, he gives you desires. Through the Holy Spirit, quickens you, puts desires in your heart for the things that he wants you to carry out in the service of the Lord. Whatever God's put in your heart, notice he said God's with you. That means God's going to perform it. He's going to bring it to pass. So whatever God has placed in your heart to do, you do it and know that God is with you and he will bring it to pass. In Psalms 1, Verse 2, it says his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law does he meditate day and night. What are we to do? We're to be meditating in his word. Our delight, our pleasure should be in the word of God that we want to hear and do the things he says. What's going to happen? If you have this, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And that means you're going to have all kinds of blessings coming your way. Fruit's going to be coming out of you. His leaf also shall not wither. That means no destructions coming your way. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Everything you do, God wants to prosper it. He doesn't want you not to prosper. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to prosper in all you do. If you delight in the word of God and you are carrying out what he says, meditating on day and night, this is what you live and walk by, then you are going to prosper in your life. This is why God wants us to do these things. The light in the word. 
Psalms 15, verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? That's abiding in the presence of God, and the holy hill is Mount Zion they come up to, having conquered their enemies and their place of victory. He that walketh uprightly, worketh righteousness, speaketh truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, <clears throat> nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor. It says, In whose eyes a vile person condemned, but he honors them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor takes reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. God wants us to be doers, because what is he saying here? If we'll do what he says, we'll abide in the tabernacle. We will dwell in the holy hill, having conquered our enemies. God expects us to walk uprightly, putting the word first place. Work righteousness. That means no unrighteousness in our life. We're only going to work what's right. We're going to speak the truth in our heart. We're not going to speak things contrary to the word. We're going to speak the truth. We're not going to be backbiting with our tongue or doing any evil or any kind of reproach whatsoever, any of these things. We're going to have the fear of the Lord. Notice he says he honors those that have the fear of the Lord. We're going to hate evil. We're going to do what God wants us to do. And he says here that we're not going to put our money out for usury, for interest, take advantage of people, take reward against the innocent. He that does these things shall never be moved. See, we're doing everything unto the Lord. God's the one who's going to supply. He's going to meet every need. And he's going to honor you and bless you and you are going to dwell in the tabernacle, the presence of God. Psalms 34, verse 14. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. The Lord wants us to depart from all evil. Don't let yourself be involved with anything that's contrary to God's word. Everything that's evil is going to take you down a road of destruction. You do good, you seek peace, you pursue it, then you're going to be blessed of the Lord. Over in Psalms 106, we see as we're looking at things that it says that we're to do, we're going to become a doer of the word. Psalms 106, verse 3. Blessed are those that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. What does God want us to do? He wants us to do righteousness at all times. That means that's the way we live. We're always going to do what's right. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to do, you know, Instead, it's all black and white. It's either right or it's wrong. We're not going to go the gray way, you know, and, well, you know, it's no big deal over here and kind of compromise on some things. No. We're going to walk the straight and the narrow, doing righteousness at all times. It is absolutely essential if you're going to see God's blessings come your way. We see these over in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 19. He says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Hey, we want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What's going to be the conditions? Well, we need to be doing what he says. Now, it says whosoever shall do. But shall is not the best way to translate this because this happens to be a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, the way you would translate this, whoever might do and might teach them, again, the subjunctive mood, that's the conditions. If you do and you teach the word, you're going to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So. People aren't going to be called great just because they're a born-again Christian and they've tried, they love Jesus and they've tried to walk with him and so forth. No, it all comes down to being a doer of his word. And then getting in you to the point of teaching others. God wants you to teach other people. We're to teach others and make disciples of all nations, as the Bible says, to help them come to the place of walking in the ways of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, the Bible says this, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What are the things God wants us to do? He wants us to do these things he's commanded. You are to love your enemies. That means you give people what they have need of, 
not what they deserve. Otherwise, you become a judge. If you judge, you're going to be judged. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. You don't repay evil for evil. Do good to them that hate you. Always give them what they have need of, not what they deserve. If you give them what they deserve, you just made yourself a judge, and you're going to be in trouble. We are not the judge. Who's the judge? God is the judge. He says, vengeance is mine, and I will repay. You better believe that God is the one who judges righteously. People aren't going to get away from things. What they sow, they're going to reap. God's not mocked, that's for sure. So you and I should always do the right thing. Pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. Don't ever have holding grudges or retaliatory or revengeful attitudes in your heart and your mind or get back at someone. No. We are going to do what God says to give them what they have need of because we want to see them come to the place of repentance. Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 20 says, Wherefore, by their fruits you'll know them. How are we going to know people? We know them by their fruits. Look at the fruits in their life. You know whether they're walking with the Lord or not. He goes on in verse 21. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Otherwise, just calling him Lord doesn't mean you're going to enter into the kingdom. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Remember, we saw in Luke 6, we'll look at it in just a minute, but where he said, You call me Lord, you don't do the things that I say. It was the same kind of principle here. You say, you call him Lord, but you don't do the will of the Father, we're not going to enter in. When it talks about doing, by the way, this isn't the fact that, well, I did it once. No, it's present tense. There are seven tenses in the Greek, and they're very expressive about, uh, and exact about the action of the verb. The present tense means continuous, ongoing action. So the way you would translate this, as Young's brings it out, but he who is doing the will of my Father, the one who is continually doing the will of the Father, that's the one that's going to enter in. We come down to verse 24, and he says, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. This guy's been hearing the word. Well, that's important, because then you get the knowledge of God. And notice it's a present tense, meaning he's been ongoing hearing the word, which is good. And it says he's doing them. This again is in the present tense, denoting the fact that he's continually doing the word that he hears. What about this guy? I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, floods came, winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell not. Why did it not fall? Because the person was a hearer and a doer of the word. What happens as you hear and do the word? You are building your spiritual house, and you are actually building a strong foundation so the enemy will not be able to shake you because you're walking in the word. It's your way of life. This is what you hear and do consistently. When it says it was founded, this word was founded is a particular word that refers to laying the foundation so it's established and stable. But it's interesting that this particular word, when we look up the tense of this in the Greek, which is important, why am I showing these things to you? Because we need to see what's really being said. It's a pluperfect tense. The pluperfect tense in the Greek is a past tense referring to something done in the past with past results already accomplished. And that's what it's saying. It says here that the guy was a hearer and a doer of the word. He had past results because of all the things he'd done, and it was already accomplished. This is why the way you translate a pluperfect verb, you translate it like Young's brings it out. This is Young's literal translation, probably the finest tra New Testament translation that there is today. For it had been founded on a rock, talking about in the past, and it had already been accomplished results. You see, if you build your house on the rock, then it doesn't matter what kind of attacks will come against you, you'll be able to stand against anything. If you think you're going to have to suddenly, oh, I've got to build my house right now when the attack's on, you're, you're going to get blown away. You need to have already done it. You know, I mean, think of it in the natural. Oh, there's a hurricane coming or there's a tornado coming. I've got to build this house real fast. No, you already have to have it already done before so it'll be able to stand against any kind of attacks. Well, same thing in us. But then he goes on and he says, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, he's hearing them continually, as we see. Again, present tense. That's good. That means you're hearing the word. A lot of Christians aren't even hearing the word consistently at all. This is the guy who's hearing it consistently. 
but it says he's doing them not. And when we talk about doing, that means this guy is not doing the word consistently. Remember it said the one who's doing the will of the Father, that's the one that's going to enter into the kingdom of heaven? He's likened to a foolish man. What happened with him? He's building his house on sand. He's got no foundation. He has not built this thing so it can stand. The rain descended, floods came, winds blew. Same attacks. Talking about what the devil would bring against you. Beat upon the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. This was a great fall that was occurring. And this fall wasn't just for a moment. Actually, the way this is showing you is that the guy's going to have a continual fall in his life. The reason it's, you know that, because this is an imperfect tense verb for was, which is what I put the cursor over. The imperfect tense describes past action that is continuing in the past. Past action that was continuing, not just a one-time thing. It's kind of like the present tense that's continuing action, because the imperfect is continuing action, but it's not in the present. It's in the past. So what it's saying was, it fell. And great in the past was its continual fall. Otherwise, they're going to continually fall and go down in just bad way and see destruction. Why? Because they want to continue here and do the word. That means you want to stop yourself from falling now or in the future? Be a continual doer of the word. Get this house built. Get your spiritual house built by hearing and doing the word of God. It is absolutely essential in our life. And we'll just look briefly at the same account over in Luke. But the first thing that he said is certainly very important. In verse 46, he said, Luke 6, 46, Why call me, me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Jesus is only Lord if we do what he says. He's not Lord just because we declare he's Lord and then we do what we want. Many people think, well, I confess Jesus Lord and everything's fine and yeah, everything's great. That's a lying teaching in the body of Christ. We already saw that. Not everybody who calls him Lord, Lord enters in, only the one who is doing the will of the Father. We need to be doing the things that God wants us to do. Over in John, John chapter 3, verse 20. Talking about the things that we must do if we're going to become a doer, a cons continual doer of the word. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Say, well, I don't hate the light. The light's the word of God, Jesus, you know. But if we're doing evil, we actually do hate the light in God's sight. If we're not doing what he wants, if we're doing something that's sin, which is evil, we're actually hating the light. Neither cometh the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. That shows you that light comes not just because you heard some things and got some revelation knowledge. It comes because you do the truth that you hear. The guy who is doing truth, and again, this word doing, I put the cursor over this word doing. Is this like, oh, well, I did it one time? No, it's a present tense verb again, indicating the guy who is doing the truth. That's the guy that comes to the light, and his deeds may be made manifest that they're wrought in God, because we're going to be a consistent doer of the word of God which is absolutely important. We're not going to do anything that is evil. Over in Luke, Luke chapter 6, <coughs> verse 31. <coughs> Luke 6, 31, it says, As you would that men do to you, do you also to them likewise. I want people to love me. Love them. It'll draw love back to you. I want people to be a friend to me. Be a friend to them. It'll draw it back to you. As you would that men do to you, do you also to them likewise. If you do evil to them, guess what? It's going to come right back at you. Do unto them what you would like them to do unto you. We see over in John chapter 4, verse 34. John 4, verse 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That was what he was supposed to do. He had a mission. He had, a, had a, something that was responsible to do. And his meat, or his food, spiritual food, so to speak, was that he was to do the will of the Father. By the way, this shows the fact that Jesus had the ability to choose to do it or not, because it's a subjunctive mood. 
which means it was conditional upon conditions being met. So this is why a present a subjunctive, you translate this, may do. My food is that I may do the will of him that sent me. Otherwise, I got to carry it out. I'm respons responsible to do this. It's all conditional. It, 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 God, Jesus had to do it to get this thing accomplished. He was expected to do it. This wasn't automatic. And may finish his work. Again, this is a subjunctive, in order that I might finish his work. God wants us to be the ones that are going to do what he wants. It's all conditional. You've got to put the word first place and carry it out. It's not going to be automatic. It all depends on whether you do it and finish his work. Are you doing the work that he wants? Every one of us has a work. There's a work that we must do and a way we must walk in, as we talked about in a scripture in Exodus this morning. Well, how did Jesus do things? He's our model, certainly. He's the one that's our example. John chapter 5, verse 19. Look what Jesus says. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself. Well, I thought Jesus was God and he just could do everything. No. He emptied himself of all his divine privileges. He walked as a man. He was the Son of God in the fact that his spirit came from man. But he was the Son of Man, that he had to walk the walk as a man. He could be tempted in all points. He had like sinful flesh. He walked the walk. And did he do anything of himself? No. He was taught of the Father, and we saw it in Scripture this morning. The Son could do nothing of Himself. Jesus could do nothing of Himself. If Jesus can do nothing of Himself, what about us? We can do nothing of ourselves, that's for sure. But he, what He sees the Father do, for what things soever He doeth, he, these also doeth the Son likewise. That's why whatever we see Jesus doing, who is now the Lord, and what we see in the Word of God, we're to be doing the same thing. That's the way Jesus operated. We see in verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he'll show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. So the Father showed him all the things that he was doing. Because the Father was dwelling in him, was doing the works, remember, accomplishing everything. Well, we come down to verse 30, and Jesus makes another statement. I can of mine own self do nothing. Quite a statement from Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, born from heaven. He said, I can do nothing. You and I have been born from heaven, born from above. You're in the same boat as we are, all are. We can do nothing of ourselves. As I hear, I judge. My judgment's just, because I seek not mine own will. Notice, Jesus did not seek his own will, but the will of the Father that sent me. Are you sent? Yes, you are, because you've been born from above. You've been sent from heaven. You're an ambassador for Christ. What are we to do? Don't seek your own will. Seek the will of the Father who sent you. Find out the will of the Father. How do I find that out? It's in the Bible, the Word of God. All the things that He tells us to do. That's the way you're going to walk in fellowship with God. And when you do, you're going to see God's blessings come in your life. John 6, verse 38. He says, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will. Jesus totally denied himself. So can you and I walk in our own will, what I want to do? No. If you are, you're not submitted to him. We're not doing his will. But the will of him that sent me. And we see another statement about Jesus. This is quite a statement in John 8, verse 29. Look at his testimony. He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. That's a great testimony. That's a testimony you and I want to have. We say, I always do the things that please the Lord. Can you say that? I hope you say, I can't say that. Well, we're going to confess his sin, all the things that are not of the Lord. We're going to turn away from him, and we're now going to put his word first place. We're going to do what the will of the Father is, and we're going to come to the place of always doing the things that please him. Remember, Jesus did not do the works of himself. People have not understood this. John 10, 25, Jesus answered and said, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name. He didn't do it in his name. He did it in his Father's name. How are you and I going to do the works? Now we're going to do the works, and who's the Lord over the church? Jesus. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. You can do nothing of yourself. So, you know, you minister to people, you lay hands on people, you cast out demons, you whatever. You know, you pray for some people and something happens. Don't for a minute think that, well, I did such and such. You did nothing. 
God did it through you. You and I do nothing of ourselves. People that think, oh, I got some great thing, even any gifts that God's given you, don't think for a second that that's, oh, I'm, I'm something special here. We're nothing. We're simply vessels for the Lord. You need to realize that God's the one that's going to do everything through you. You'll never have any pride or get puffed up about yourself when you understand this. The people that get pride for the ones that they start thinking that they, they're doing something themselves. No, it's God that's doing everything. John 13, 15 says, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. Every example that we see that Jesus did, that's an example for us. Say, I want to know what to do in this situation. Find out what the Word says, whatever He did or whatever the Word says. Ah, now I know what to do. I'm going to do it. That's the way you carry out everything. It's all right there in the Word. You say, well, I don't know what all that says. That's why you've got to get in the Word, study the Word. If you don't know the Word, then you won't know what to do because you won't know all the examples that He's given to us. That's why we've got to hear the Word. That's why I'm giving you Scripture after Scripture, point after point. You're hearing the Word. You're seeing the Word. You're seeing all these things so that we can do what He says. John chapter 14, verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He didn't speak of himself. He didn't speak anything of himself. That means the words you're going to speak are not going to be my opinion. You know, you get it all the time. What's your opinion of such and such? Well, my opinion is this. Forget it. Don't even listen to him for another second. People say, what's your opinion? I say, well, the word says, because I'm not going to give you my opinion. My opinion means zero. What counts? The word. That's what counts. The word is what we're going to give forth. Don't ever be drawn in. If someone asks you that, you just tell them, I don't give my opinions. I give the word of God that's the answer to situations. That's what we want to do. He goes on, verse 12, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto he that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also. You're going to do the same works. Jesus cast out the demons. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus cleansed the lepers. Jesus raised the dead. We can do all the works of God. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Greater in the fact that we got a whole lifetime to do all this stuff, a greater amount, comparative. You and I are going to can do greater amount. We got an entire lifetime. The only greater works as far as from a degree standpoint would be the fact that we do get people to get born again. Well, Jesus did down there in hell when he preached the gospel to them, but he wasn't on earth bringing people that were alive to get born again because it couldn't happen until after Jesus, of course, had gone back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit in. You and I can lead people to receive Jesus, get born again, and receive the Holy Spirit, as well as do the mighty works of the Lord. You and I have an entire lifetime to do them. So God wants us to get busy doing the works of the Lord. Over in Romans, Romans chapter 13, in verse 3, it says this, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you'll have praise of the same. Well, where's my, that's why we need to obey the laws. Just do whatever the laws say. If we don't like the laws, we work to get them changed and bring them in line with what's righteous. At the same time, do you ever compromise the word of God for anything that's a con that the law says? No, you always do the word of God, of course, but at the same time, we can't be those that just ignore the law. No, we do that which is good, and we'll have praise of the same. He goes on and says, He's the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, because judgments are going to come on you because you broke the law. He that beareth not the sword in vain, he's the minister of God, or avenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's why we want to do what's right, so that we're not going to see wrath come upon us. We see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, another thing that we do. And we'll be doing this Sunday morning. We'll be having communion, but this is what it's talking about next Sunday morning. It says, 1 Corinthians 11, 24, When he given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do you in remembrance of me. When we partake of communion, we're doing it in remembrance of the things that Jesus has accomplished for us. His body was broken for us. His blood was poured out in order to accomplish the redemption so that you and I could be set free. We see in Philippians chapter 2, another thing that it tells us is what, one of the things that we're to be doing 
Philippians 2.14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Don't be a murmurer. Don't be a disputer, you know. Be negative things, reasonings. Do the word. Just carry it out. Do the things he says. Otherwise, we've got to be sure we do it with a right heart attitude at all times. We also see over in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, you pick up in verse 22. He tells us more. Servants, that would refer to like an employee, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. So what do we do? We do our work unto the Lord. We obey, do these things unto the Lord as we're fearing God with singleness of heart. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Or this refers to here when we look at this, it's actually got two Greek words. This is not out of your heart. This is the word suke. It's from out of the soul, as Young's brings out exactly. Out of the soul, as to the Lord and unto men. What's your soul? Your will, intellect, and emotions. So you're going to do things out of the soul, out of your will, out of your mind, out of your emotions, everything you're going to do to the Lord, not unto men. You don't do things unto men. You do things unto the Lord, and then you're going to be pleasing Him. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, because you serve the Lord Christ. Notice, that means one of the ways that you serve the Lord is being obedient in doing your work unto the Lord in obedience to your employer. You're actually serving the Lord in doing that. In singleness of heart, fearing God, doing it out of the soul unto the Lord, not to men, you're going to receive the reward of the inheritance because he says you serve the Lord Christ. We see another thing that he tells us he wants us to do. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 10, he says this, And indeed you do it toward all the brethren that are in Macedonia. We beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. What's he talking about? He's talking about brotherly love. Verse 9 says, As touching brotherly love, this is where we get our word Philadelphia from, loving the brotherhood. You need not that I write unto you, for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. God expects us to walk in love towards every per person. You are commanded to walk in love to everybody, and especially to the household of faith, the believers in Christ, brotherly loved. We should never, ever get outside of love in dealing with people. You, they may, they're, even if they're, they're walking contrary to the word, you're still going to walk in love toward them. You've got to always, don't ever get in strife, don't get in arguments, don't get bitter, don't get resentful, don't get in the negatives and so forth. No. He wants us to increase more and more in brother love. There's no excuse for us ever to go outside of love in our dealings with anybody in the body of Christ. First, that means you're not going to be mean. You're not going to be showing anger. You're not going to be strifeful. You're not going to be condemning. You're not going to be belittling. Any of these kind of things. Never. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. What's God want? He wants you to minister comfort to people and edify them. Give them the word. That also, you can correct them. You correct them with the word, but you don't do it in a condemning way. You do it in a way to help them to come to repentance. You're going to comfort others, though, and edify them so that you're ministering life to them. Otherwise, we shouldn't be doing anything to tear people down. Don't be tearing people down with your words or your attitude or the things you do. Don't be con condescending towards people. That's a mistake. You always should be building up and comforting and ministering life to them. 2 Thessalonians 3, 4. We have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. Now that's pretty good. So we got confidence in you. I know that you're going to do it, and I know that you will do in the future the things that we have commanded you. Uh, that's a good report. And of course, the word do is not just that I do it once. It's a present tense verb that I'm continually doing. We have confidence that we know that you're going to continually do the will of the Father. You're going to do the Word of God. And you will do in the future the things we command you. Hey, that means if God can say that of you, then hey, that means he knows, hey, this guy's walking the walk. He's got the fruit. He's got the evidence. He, this guy's showing forth that he's, he's trustworthy. That's someone who is so shown to be faithful. Second Timothy, chapter 4, verse 5, tells us something else. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. 
The Lord has given you a ministry. Every one of us are to preach the gospel, cast out demons, minister healing to people, help them be set free. You're going to do the work of an evangelist to reach people. Don't think, well, that's not my ministry. Well, you may not have an evangelist calling on your life, but nonetheless, you're still going to do the work of an evangelist because you're going to preach the gospel and call people to repentance and lead them to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So don't ever think that's not your ministry of preaching the gospel. No, it is. Hebrews chapter 13, we see over in verse 16 something else it tells us. To do good and to communicate, which means to have fellowship, it's a Greek word koinonia, forget not, for with what such sacrifices God is well pleased. Doing good. See, when you're doing good, you're actually, that's a sacrifice to please God. So do always do good. Remember you do good to those even that do evil towards you? Always do good. Go out of your way to do good for people. Don't sit there and just be passive and not enter into doing good that you can do something good. He wants you to be doing good. He wants you to be doing the works of God and reaching out to people. And that's a sacrifice unto the Lord. He's expecting us to do it. We also see over in James chapter 2, over here in verse 8. He says, If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. We want to do well. What are you going to do? What's the royal law? That's the law of kings. Who are you? You're a king. You're a king and a priest unto God. What are we to do? Love thy neighbor as thyself. You're going to love everybody the same way you'd love yourself. You're going to treat them the same way you'd want to treat yourself. You can't be treating people differently than the way you treat yourself and think that you're loving your neighbor. No. Again, you've got to walk in love towards every person just as you would show love towards yourself. If you do so, then God says you do well. James 4, verse 11 tells us something else. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Hmm, we don't want to speak negatives. Now, that's not saying you can't expose things that are wrong. We need to expose things that are wrong. Some people think, well, you should never say anything evil about anybody. Not so, because... This is just, just cutting somebody down for no reason. For instance, didn't Paul talk about Alexander the coppersmith that did me much harm? He talked about all the different ones that did evil things to him. He was bringing it so they would understand that this person was not walking right and bringing forth things that were contrary to the word. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaks evil is brother and judges his brother speaks evil of law and judges the law. In other words, if you're just cutting someone down just to cut them down, to judge them, that's your motivation, not to maybe br bring forth truth so somebody doesn't follow after that, or so you're helping to see someone, hey, this is not the way we want to walk, we want to walk in the way of the Word of God here. There's nothing wrong with that, but if you're speaking to cut that person down, to judge them, you're judging your brother, you're speaking evil of the law and judging the law. If thou judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. In other words, Who's the judge? God's the judge. So don't be speaking evil things against people, just arbitrarily about things. Otherwise, you don't go reporting all their evil things that they did. Would well, you see what so-and-so did? You know, all these things. No. But if there's a purpose for it, to warn somebody or to help them, help them understand the truth, then that's a different situation. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 11. Let him eschew, which means to turn aside from evil, and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. God wants you always to do good. We see this several times that he's expecting us to do this. Now, over in 2 Peter, we see something else. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it talks about how we've obtained like precious faith through the righteousness of God. And it talks about how grace and peace will be multiplied to us through the exact, correct, precise, correct knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then it talks about how the divine power that comes from in the Word of God is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, precise, correct knowledge of Him. So the Word brings the power of God to bring everything that we have need of in life. And so how are we going to possess it? By possessing the promises, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. That means you're not a partaker of the divine nature if you don't possess the promises. 
That's why it says you know people by their fruit. Their fruit shows whether they've been possessing the promises in their life or not. And of course, that means they're walking in the spirit. They've escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. They're not walking after the flesh. You don't want to see the fleshly works. Those are, that's not the promises of God. We're going to have to possess the promises. Then he goes on and says, besides this, give all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, which is moral excellence, moral goodness, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance. Temperance is that which is self-control, keeping the flesh under control. To temperance, patience. Patience is a steadfastness, and this is of the soulish realm. Temperance keeps control of the flesh. Patience keeps control of the soul. Luke 21 says, in your patience possess you your souls. That's the will, intellect, and emotions. In your steadfastness, you'll keep the soulish realm in line. And to patience, godliness, which is showing reverence and godliness to God because you're doing His Word, being a hearer and a doer. To godliness, brotherly kindness, showing love towards all the brothers and sisters. And to brotherly kindness, charity, which is love, agape love, to all. He goes on and says, If these things be in you, they're to be in us because of the Word in us, and bound, that means the fruit's coming and more fruit's coming because we're seeing it happen in our life, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will bring forth fruit. But he that lacks these things, he's blind. You could be born again and be blind. You cannot see afar off. He's forgotten he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That's quite a statement. We're called. An election means you're chosen, being chosen, the act of being chose, chosen, chosen. Make your calling and your cho being chosen sure, set, stable, fast, firm. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. And when we talk about doing, again, this isn't like I did it once. This is your lifestyle. Present tense, continuous, repeated, ongoing action. If you continually do these things, you shall never fall, is what he's saying. What things? You're going to be walking on the Word, possessing the promises of God. You're going to be walking in moral excellence, after knowledge, temperate, keeping the soul and the flesh in line, patience, steadfast, keeping the soul in line, godliness, hearing and doing the Word, showing brotherly kindness, showing love. These things are all essential. If you do these things, you'll never fall, and you'll make your calling and election sure. God wants us to do that. In fact, it even goes on in the next verse and says, verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These guys are entering into the kingdom. Remember what it said back in Matthew 7? Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord's entered in. Only those that are doing the will of the Father are going to enter in. He expects us to do these things. Verse 19, we also have a more sure word of prophecy, that you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Who's that? That's Jesus through the word. We're going to do well that we take heed to his word, and he's going to manifest himself in our heart through the word, which is going to be evidenced by us walking in the ways of the Lord and bringing forth fruit in our life. Third John, verse 6, we see something else which have borne witness of thy charity or love before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, you do well. Otherwise, they were sending him forth worthily. They were helping him out so he would do well. It means we help people to go forth on their journey. We give to people who are in need. We help them and minister to them. Now, that's, uh, so that's what you're going to do for brothers and sisters in the Lord, to help them. We also see over in Revelation something. Revelation chapter 2 in verse 5. Let's read verse 3, and 2 and 3, 4, 5, first of all. He said, I know thy works. And he said this to every one of the churches. He said, I know your labor, your patience, how you can't bear them that, that are evil. You tried those that say they're apostles and are not, and you found them liars. And we need to. We need to be sure we find out who's the true and who's the false. You born and have patience, and by name's sake, you've labored and you haven't fainted. They were doing a good job. They didn't faint. But he says there's something else, though. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because you left your first love. 
If they left their first love, they had now something else that became their first love. Jesus wasn't their first love anymore. And he says, Remember wherefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Because what's evidence that Jesus is your first love? Because you do the works of following him and obeying him. That means we shouldn't draw back or backslide from things that we have once done. We should be doing the things of God and doing the works that we have done, showing the love of God, because we do His Word, we do His commandments, then, of course, He's going to be pleased with us. It's quite a statement He makes there, though. These people had fallen away. They weren't doing what God wanted. He says, Repent, do the first works, or else I'll come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of thy place, out of his place. That means the light's going to go out, except thou repent. God wants us to always do the works of God. That shows, remember, the fruit and that reveals whether you're following him or not. One last scripture for tonight before we close. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments. The word do, again, it's in the present tense. The one who is doing the commandments. Blessed are those who are doing consistently his commandments. That they, the King James says, that may have right to the tree of life. We pointed out this morning, but we'll bring it out to you again. It's not a good translation. The word have is not have. It is a to be verb. The to be verb. It also is a future tense verb. How do you translate future tense? Shall something. That's the way you say something in the future tense. So what it's saying is, blessed are those that do, are doing his commandments, that they shall, something shall be theirs. And Young's brings it out because he brings the right order on this, because the word right here is a means authority or right. And he brings it out in this way, that the authority shall be theirs, or the right shall be theirs unto the tree of life. That tells us something. If we are doing the commandments, then we know that we shall have the right to the tree of life. It means it's a, it's a set deal with God. It's, you're going to enter in for sure. And you may enter in. Now, this shows conditions, because this is a subjunctive mood, verb, conditional. Essentially, it's saying that you may enter in because you met the conditions through the gates into the city. What city? That's the heavenly Jerusalem. And that's where we're all going to end up if we're not here at the return of Jesus, be caught up to meet him in the air. So, blessed are those that are doing his commandments, that the right or authority shall be theirs to the tree of life. And that's what we're going to partake of. And that we then may enter in through the gates into the city. This is why it's so important for us to be doers of the word and become consistent doers of the word. So we've seen a lot of things tonight that are important. We've seen the fact that we're to do all that, we're, all that he's spoken, we're to be obedient, we're to do the vows that we've spoken, the words, whatever you say you're going to do, do it. We get the armor on through the word and enter the spiritual fight. We can't turn to the right or the left. We've got to do the commandments of the New Testament. We repent with all of our heart. Put away the evil. Prepare your heart and serve God. Do what's right. Repair the breaches or where the breaks in the house of the Lord, which is in the church as you go to minister to others. Do things with all of your heart. Delight in the word. Walk uprightly. Work righteousness. Speak truth. Don't backbite. Don't do evil. Have the fear of the Lord. Do righteousness. Teach the word to others. Do good to those that hate you. Always will love your enemies. Always pray for those that have persecuted you or used you. Do continually the things that God wants to build your spiritual house. Do truth. So you come to the light. Do to others what you would like them to do to you. Always do the things that please the Lord like Jesus did. Do nothing of yourself. Do the works of the Father now in Jesus' name. You and I are going to do what's good. We're going to partake of communion in remembrance of what he's accomplished. We do all things without murmuring, disputing. We do everything out of our soul unto the Lord because we're, going to get the, we're serving the Lord. We're going to get the reward of Christ. We are also going to show brotherly love to the brethren, comfort and edify them. Do continually now in the future all the things that he says. We're going to do the work of evangelists because God wants you preaching the gospel and winning people to the Lord. Do good as a spiritual sacrifice to God. 
Do the word in all that you do. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't judge him, remember. Do good, do moral excellence, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, so you're making your call and election sure, so you have an entrance into the heavenly kingdom, as he says. And you and I are going to also take heed to the more sure word of prophecy, and we're going to send forth others worthily as we're ministering to their needs. Do the first works. Don't ever leave your first love. And don't ever turn away from following the ways of the Lord. Do the commandments of the New Testament, and you and I, are, it'll be our right to the tree of life, and we're going to enter into the heavenly city, the city of Jerusalem in heaven. Praise God. Being a doer of the word is so important. We got one more session to talk about this. It's going to be on Wednesday night. We're going to see scriptures that talk about the results of doing the Word of God and becoming a continual doer. It's essential. Just being a hearer of the Word isn't going to get you anywhere. It's doing the Word. So as you hear it, do it. Hear and do. Hear and do. Hear and do. And do it consistently. God will bring all the things that He wants to pass in your life, and you'll see great blessings coming upon you. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that reveals unto me what I am to do to become a continual doer of the word of God. I will be a doer of this word. And as I walk in the light of it, I will become a consistent doer of the word. And I will see your blessings come upon me in my life. And I will please you. And I will enter into the heavenly kingdom and I will have the right to the tree of life because I'm continually keeping and doing your commandments. Thank you, Lord. I will be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. One more session on this subject. It'll be the results. You're going to see many different scriptures. You're going to see the important results of being a doer of the Word, what God will accomplish in your life and how important it is for us. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We'll be doers of this Word, and we thank you there'll be much fruit because we take hold of your Word and apply it and carry it out in our life. Thank you. We're going to guard ourselves so the devil doesn't take this out of our heart. We're going to do it, and we're going to be consistent at it, and we know there's going to be great fruit and great blessing will come as we do your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.